Uh, welcome back to um, workshop, uh, no, sorry, not workshop, workload 41C, um, preparatory chemistry. So we're going to pick off where we left off um, last time, which is um, we were talking about chemical formulas, chemical representations. So just to recap, um, we can represent... Um, we can represent um, how we talk about, uh, you know, chemical compounds, um, molecules by using their atomic symbols and subscripts to denote um, in a compound how much of each atom or each type of atom there are. And um, just to recap, for example, we can have Si, Si, Cl4, which is silicon. Tetrachloride. So in this in this case, we have one silicon atom, and four chlorine atoms. Okay, so um, we'll go uh, we'll go into more detail about what these compounds mean, how do we name them, the types, of, uh, the types of species that consist of the compound. For example, is it a non-metal? Is it a metal ion? Is it a, or is it just a pure element? All right, so um, next we're gonna talk about, um, so today's date is the, um, uh, will be the A, so this actually will be the A, but I'm gonna record it earlier, so. Um, so um uh that'll be so you'll actually get it um so uh, you, i'll actually get to post it ahead of time um because i don't want to record too late because i might not be able to post it in time okay anyway we're going to talk about atoms and molecules so there is a distinction between atom and molecule. Atom is the smallest particle of an element. So an element's identity, um, the smallest um, the smallest existence of an element is uh, called an atom. So we refer to them as atoms, the helium atom, the oxygen atom, the carbon atom. So in our world, um, we are, everything's composed of elements and atoms, even if it's um, non-living or in living systems, such as ourselves, living, li uh, living organisms and so forth. So the smallest unit of an element or smallest particle is an atom. So the thing about atoms, they, um, they can combine to form different kinds of what we call compounds. So, you know, when our universe began, you know, there was, there was only a certain, uh, certain uh, types of elements and, you know, the, um, result from the Big Bang uh, caused these elements to kind of combine and gave birth to not only our universe, um, but, you know, um, life, on, life on Earth. So certain elements combined with other elements to form amino acids, so to, so to speak. So there, it's, um, it's possibly that's how life began, by the combination of atoms to form uh, different chemical compounds. Okay, so can combine with atoms of other elements to form chemical compounds. All right, um, next let's talk about molecules. So let's just underline the word atom here, molecules. 
So molecule. So uh, likewise, molecule refers to um, refers to a combination of atoms, right? A molecule like the water molecule. So when we're talking about pure substances, a water molecule, we're talking about the smallest unit particle or smallest, um, well, we call it unit because it's a combination of atoms, right? O and two hydrogen atoms. So we call it the smallest, smallest unit particle of a pure substance. Um, and this is a little copy. Uh, this is just a little technical um, um, thing here. It can exist independently and possess the identity of the substance. For example, you know, um, even though there's not, even though there's a, it's a drop of water, uh, it's composed of the the, uh, the liquid coming out of your, like your faucet. That small drop still represents um, the substance water. Okay, so that's uh, molecules. Uh, let me just check. Okay, so next we're going to talk about. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about the law of constant composition. So let's talk about that. So now we're gonna talk about the law of constant So what this, this states that um, any compound, so this is the, the, the basics of it. Any compound is always made up of elements, up of elements in the same Same proportion by mass. So what that means is, for example, um, if you have double the amount of hydrogen atoms and then an oxygen atom in water, the mass um, is going to be the um, is going to be distributed by the proportion of you know the number of atoms in your compound. So. Um, so so that, that applies to all compounds. Say you have maybe HCl, there'll be the mass will be a, a combination of the hydrogen and the chlorine atoms. So all compounds will have this constant um, makeup that is relative to the uh, number of atoms in the chemical formula. All right, so let's keep going. Okay, so now we're going to, so we've been talking about like matter, um, you know, what makes up matter, like um, the smallest unit of matter. So now we're going to go um, talk about the characteristics that allow ma uh, matter to interact with other, other matter to do chemical reactions. So that is called the electrical character of matter. Let's, let's just do that, electrical character. So 
So first thing we have is static electricity. Uh, this is also called the electrostatic force. So we also call it the electrostatic force. So the, these are the forces of attraction or repulsion between electrically charged objects. Um, so let's write that down. Forces of attraction, attraction or repulsion between, okay. electrically charged objects. Okay. And um, electric charge is a physical property of matter. So no matter what happens during a chemical reaction, um, these particles will always remain, or these new compounds will always remain and have electrical, uh, an electric charge. So there's two types of charges, right? Um, if you remember from, from physics, we have two types. Here are the types of electric charge. So we have positive, and negative. And remember the phrase like charges re uh, repel. So light charges will repel. So say I have a positive charge and a positive charge, they will repel each other. So they will they will re repel each um repel. Let me draw that a little bit better. Oops. So they want to repel each other then two light charges. Um, sorry, not two light charges. Unlike charges will attract. So this is repulsion, attraction. So like charges repel. Um, unlike charges attract. So this is the law of physics. So when we have two like charges, they will repel each other and tend to get far away. And then when we have two unlike charges, they will attract and you get the attractive force. Okay, so the common experiment for the existence of charges is, uh, remember, um, you know, if you like, um, so the classic example um, of this experiment is, you know, when you, you have a piece of cloth, like maybe like your shirt or something and a balloon. Um, so when you rub the, so say I have this piece of cloth right here right and I have this balloon right here so say I um So the um so remember um when I when I um when I rub so say I rub the cloth on the balloon right so one 
you rub cloth on balloon. So what this does, it agitates the electrons from the balloon to the cloth. So now my cloth, um, it's going to have a bunch of electrons on it that weren't originally there, right? So let's note that by name charges right here. And then my balloon here is going to have a net loss of electrons. So our balloon um, will be will be now net positively charged. So let's just add four plus charges, just arbitrar arbitrarily saying we lost four electron charges, right? So now um, if I hold the balloon to something, say like water or maybe um, anything else that anything else in the room, maybe a wall or something. So now um, if I hold the balloon to um, say like, um, it could be anything really. So let's say I have a faucet here. So here's my faucet. And here's the water, right? So if I if I bring these two together, now my balloon, which is positively charged, and I bring it closer to the water, I'll actually get a net effect of here's my balloon now. And um, sorry, the water here will now um now, if you bring it closer, you can see the water kind of, instead of going down like this, it's going to kind of curve towards the balloon. Uh, of course, let's make this sink bigger so we don't spill anything. So the water, the water, since the water has electrons, right? Electrical charges, that positive charge is going to induce an attractive effect towards the balloon and that confirms the existence of matter of being electrically charged. All right, so there's many examples of this. Um, this is just one. Of, this is just one of the uh, one of the examples I, I learned, and I, I actually verified myself. So it's a pretty cool experiment. So, so for two, we'll say ring balloon to water. I think another experiment is where you take the balloon after it's you um it's elective um now it's um it's no longer electrically neutral it's a positive charge. I think if you have like a, a board or maybe a wall I think it should stick to the wall because uh due to the attractive forces. Um but I haven't tested that out. That'll be a cool experiment to try though. Anyway so um so that's the example of you know, matter being electrically charged. So hopefully that schematic is a little bit helpful. Um, in the slides, there also is a de depiction. I kind of went off on that. That's why um, I kind of paused a bit just to um, um, give you a, maybe just a different example uh, that, that it can apply to any, any object really. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, okay. Okay, let's let's move forward, shall we? All right. Okay, so now we're going to go into very um. Uh, this is just in more introductory stuff. So um, uh, just to get you guys familiar uh, about talking about chemistry. Okay. So now we're going to talk about. Hold on, guys. Let me just check the time a bit. Okay, good. Um, so now let's talk about the chemical equation. So chemical equation, um, what um, it's known as the symbolic representation of chemical change.
So um, what that means is that um, when we talk about chemical reactions, um, the, the, reaction, the chemical equation is the foundation for all of them. So when we talk about reactions, that, that's the language we use to convey what's happening um, when a reaction takes place. Okay, so in the chemical equation, you have reactants. So we, we might have heard that before. So they are the chemical formulas of the original, original substances. So what we call a formula of original substance. So they will appear on the left side of the arrow, but um, you know, what, what or not you're talking about the forward reaction or the backward reaction is all relative, but usually um, the, when we talk about the forward direction, we're talking about um, the arrow pointing to the left. So reactants are usually on the left side of the equation. Products. So products, uh, they're the formula of the new substances that you just formed. So formula of new substances. Of new substances formed. Okay, so here's an example. Let's move this down. So say I have pure carbon plus oxygen gas. Give me CO2. So on my left side, these are my reactants. And on the right side is my product because I only have one product, so we call that a singular. Um, then, so you may have seen this before, but um, you may remember that in, uh, maybe in um, high school, you had to kind of put numbers in front of the, the chemical symbols, right? So um, that's called, uh, how, that's how we balance the chemical reaction. So it goes like, whatever you put in, um, uh, all matter must be conserved, right? You can't create or, or destroy matter. So everything on the left side must be balanced with everything on the right side. So that includes charge and um, the, uh, the elements. So if I have one carbon on the left side, I must end up with a, a carbon on the right side. And you must do that for every element. So it's kind of like chemical accounting. You're, um, you're auditing um, what you put in versus what you, what you get out of a reaction. So that, that comes in the, that plays an important role. Um, if you ever, if people ever go into like industry where you have to optimize um, processes um, because um, um, that loss, say, say you start out with a certain amount of substances and you only got like a 50% yield. So you only recovered half of the, half of the mass that you put in. So the people will ask you though, Oh, where did the other 50% go? And, um, that's, that's, um, that's one application of how we use chemical reactions to improve processes, processes to make materials and stuff. And it all re re revolves around these chemical equations. Okay. So the coefficients, so coefficients, may be used to, so to achieve atom balance. So that's that, um, that what I was just talking about, atom balance in the equation. Okay, so for example, say I have two water, Actually, that's not, that's not, um, uh, hold on, let's, let's, uh, do this. So, this is called decomposition reaction, and, um, um, so this is the reverse reaction of water. So, instead of forming water from hydrogen and oxygen gas, excuse me, you form, uh, you decompose water to, to, um, to its, uh, to its, um, the gaseous elements. So, um, um, I don't know if you ever heard of water splitting, but, um, that's, a that's a I, that's a pretty, um, 
hot area for like research and, um, and energy, like uh, fuel cells, stuff like that. Um, so um, they're trying to find ways to better efficiently split water using using like um, photovoltaic cells, like sunlight that uses sunlight in the um, because um, the best energy source is the sun, right? Um, you don't want to um, generate energy costs by using using heat if you if you uh, if you can um, if you don't have to, right? So in this case, notice here that I have two hydrogens on the left and I have two hydrogens on the right, but I only have one oxygen on the left, so I need to balance it. So how we balance it is we um, um, we put two here. So now we have two oxygens and two oxygens on the right. However, now we have four hydrogens on the left. So, so to balance that, we just put a two in front of the H2, and there you go. The equation is now balanced. You have four hydrogens on the left, four hydrogens on the right, and two oxygens on both sides. So that's how we balance reactions. Um, we'll talk about balancing reactions much uh, later in the course, later in a chapter, so don't worry too much about balancing right now. Okay. Okay, so now let's talk about energy. So energy and chemical change. So what is energy? So people may remember that energy is ability to do work or transfer heat. So, so uh, remember, we need energy to carry out various, various tasks. So energy is the ability to work is, you know, to, um, it's energy required to, that's associated, you know, with like a chemical reaction or heat transfer, right? So um, you may recall learning about this, but um, in our purpose, uh, you know, in every chemical reaction, uh, there's going to be energy transferred uh, between uh, between two different, um, you know, or basically between the products and the reactants, right? So there's going to be an energy change associated with it, and that gives rise to these chemical reactions. So um, there's two types, exothermic. So let me... Uh... So we have two types, exothermic reaction. So exothermic reaction, chemical change that transfers energy energy to the surrounding, to the surroundings. For example, here's my example right here. Burning butane. So I don't know if anyone has barbecued lately, but uh, you know, because given the circumstances, man, I, I miss barbecues a lot. <laughs> Um, I've been craving them recently, but um, anyway, um, so when you go to, you know, like barbecue outside, you burn your grill, like with um, propane gas, and uh, the same thing, butane is just another type of fuel, you may find it in lighters, um, so butane, when we burn butane, you know, we're, um, we're using a fuel and mixing with oxygen and an ignition source to generate heat. Right, so that's an example of an exothermic reaction because as the reaction happens, you can see heat evolve or things getting hot. So that's that's a sign of an exothermic reaction. So this example, we have two butane molecules. Um, 
gives us HCO2 So whenever you see energy on the on the right side of the equation as a product, you know you have an exothermic reaction because you're generating heat. Um, and we talked about can um, in chemical change, there's also kinetic energy. So when things react, they they carry some kinetic energy, and that that kinetic energy actually helps with um, with carrying out a reaction. Um, so if you if two, re, uh, two reactants, you know, collide with the right energy, right kinetic energy, and um, some, other, some other requirements, they can affect a chemical reaction. So kinetic energy is energy due to the motion. So yeah, a lot of these terms, they come from physics, as you may or may not remember. So they will pop up again in chemistry because chemistry and physics are overlapped in terms of the concepts. Energy due to the motion, sorry, of an object. Object. Okay. So, right, so, um, so like if a um, low kinetic energy means something's moving very slow, then something moving very fast will have higher kinetic energy. And that's why um, usually in reactions, you, you play with the temperature to kind of increase the reaction rate. So um, that all has to do with the kinetic energy. Okay, uh, next let's talk about endothermic. So I'm gonna circle exothermic. I'll make it red, so X and X right here. Kinetic energy. Now let's talk about endothermic. So I'm gonna use endothermic blue because um, uh, um, because endothermic is the exact opposite of uh, exothermic. So chemical change. Chemical change. So it's a chemical change that removes energy. Energy from the surrounding. So it's the exact opposite. So, um, so our example is photosynthesis. Um, because you require energy to convert, um, you know, this is called, uh, you know, when you're um, capturing carbon, um, like what plants do, they use photosynthesis to capture the carbon uh, from carbon dioxide and they convert it to like uh, to uh, glucose and oxygen. So they convert, they convert it to um, more meaningful um, compounds. So that's the, that's the beauty of it. So Always remember, um, save the trees, you know, um, and uh, climate change is a real thing. Um, we're losing all these fires, are causing all the trees to burn. And, you know, that releases more um, monoxide, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and it's depleting our ability to kind of convert it and generate oxygen. So, um, you know, that's a real challenge for the next generation. You know, you know um, we're always working to kind of come at it, especially in chemical research, um, chem chemical research, and also um, environmental science. Anyway, um, so endothermic reaction from surroundings. So example here is photosynthesis. Another example is, I don't know if you ever use like cooling packs, but um, the, uh, when, you, when you activate them, a chemical reaction causes it to, um, to, gen, uh, to uh, make it appear cold. And that's because it's an endothermic reaction, which absorbs energy. And um, that, that absorb, uh, that, that uh, taking in of energy causes, 
causes the temperature to go down, uh, causes um, something to feel cold, and then that's what we classify as endothermic. So photosynthesis, 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus energy gives us glucose plus oxygen. Okay, and the last thing we'll talk about is potential energy. So not the last thing, the last thing on this um, for uh, for our energy, I think chemical energy talk. Potential energy. So potential energy. Um, you may have heard physics is is like the position of something. That's the thing also in here. So it's the energy due to the spatial or due to the, the arranged due to the arrangements arrangement of the charged particles in a system so like you recall the physics, like if you have a rock standing on a hill, the higher it is on the hill, the more potential energy it has because um, it'll, um, it'll have a longer path to fall down and roll down the hill, right? So that's kind of the same thing, but on an atomic scale, it's due to the charged particles in the system. So um, depending on how space, you know, two charges are in a chemical system or in a, in a reaction. Okay. Um, okay, so remember uh, we, um, remember there's a relationship between mass and energy. So the mass energy equivalence. So that is caused by, so that, is caused by, um, well, not caused by, so the most famous one is by Albert Einstein and his theory, theory of that of nature, there's a likeness between energy and mass. So the, the equivalence is E equals MC squared as proposed by Einstein, Albert Einstein. And what this means, uh, so that the that's the fundamental principle of nature, right? That of energy, it's related to to the mass, and uh, and the relationship is between uh, with the speed of light, which is c. So e is energy. M is mass. And C is the speed of light. The speed of light. Okay. So um, don't worry too much about this equation. We're just relating back matter and energy. Okay, so now we have laws of conservation, right? Do you all remember the laws of conservation? There's three. Um, let's, let's go about, let's go over them. So here we go, the laws of conservation. Uh, this, pen, uh, this pen is a little bit um, too bold, so let's, let's, let's um, Let's go down a uh, thinness. So one law of conservation of mass and energy. So what this states is that the total quantity of mass and energy
in the universe is fixed and does not change. So what this suggests is that of everything that may occur, like um, chemical reactions, it's always a transfer and not a um, increase or decrease of the quantity of mass. So you cannot destroy or create more matter. It's a simple matter of conversion and conservation. Two, we have the law of conservation of mass. So that's what I was just talking about. So total mass of reactants in a chemical change is equal to the total mass of the products. So if I put in five grams worth of my starting materials or my reactants, I should get equally five grams out in my products. So the total amount of reactants, the mass should equal to the total mass of my products. Okay, and thirdly we have the law of conservation of energy, law of So this states, oops, sorry. This states the quantity of energy within an isolated system. does not change. So um, in a more, in a more like application sense, um, during a chemical reaction, Or oh, sorry, um, yeah, don't, during a chemical reaction, but I think I'm going to say change here. During chemical change, energy within the system is conserved. And niter is created or destroyed. All right, guys. So that's the three laws of conservation and states that mass and energy is neither created nor destroyed and everything is conserved. Okay. So um, one, one nice example of this is where, um, you know, um, you know, when you, you know, PG&E, they provide the natural gas, they provide heating, and, um, or, you know, the, they provide natural gas, which in turn uh, powers a generator that gives electricity to your home and uh, that powers all your appliances. So even though you get electricity, it's, it's not like it's being created for you. It's simply a result of the, um, the conservation of energy. So um, from, from uh, say, a, from a different source, right? So say there's like a reaction between the natural gas or like a boiler and that causes um, to generate 
electricity using using water. So it's all a uh, conservation or transfer of energy. Um, that makes that makes um, it possible for how how for how we live. All right, guys, that is chapter two. So. So hopefully that wasn't too bad. We're going to move on to chapter three. So chapter two homework will pretty much go um, over to like the introductory material. And I, I think it also has a review of some math concepts. So like logarithms, um, exponents. So I'll give you a review for math so that you'll definitely need to be comfortable doing for Gen Chem, for especially 2A. And, um, 2A will have lots of calculations involved with the labs. So it's essential that you um, have a, you're, or you're comfortable with your math skills. Okay, so that is chapter two. Um, so we have 30 minutes left, so let's begin chapter three. I think I spent way too long on chapter two, so let's go into chapter three. Okay. And if there's any questions about the uh, about the material, always feel free to let me know. Okay. So now we're going to change gears. So chapter three. Okay. So chapter three. We're going to talk about measurements and chemical calculations. All right, so let's begin. All right, so we're going we're going to talk about like conversions, uh, scientific notation, how to represent numbers in a chemical, uh, like in a in a laboratory setting. So we're going to go over um, the metric system and significant figures, stuff like that. Okay, so scientific notation. So scientific notation. So you may recall it's a method of writing numbers. Numbers in the form a point B C D times 10 to the E. Whoops, where to go? So the form A point B um, C D is the form you should write scientific notation. So you shouldn't be saying A B dot C D, that is incorrect. And um, on exams and quizzes, um, I will mark you off slightly for that. Um, the reason being, because that's not the standard way of doing it and, and no one writes it like that um, in, in literature, in publications for in, in the science community. So it won't, it won't be of any benefit of, to you guys, uh, to, uh, to everyone, sorry. Um, so, so what we say is A, this, is my coefficient and this is my exponent. So it's always a factor of 10 to the power of positive or negative number. So this exponent is always a whole number. So it's a whole, uh, I'm sorry, that's very bad, whole number. And it could be, so let's just say whole positive or negative number. So it can take on a positive or negative number. For example, plus six, negative eight, et cetera. Okay. So for you now, like maybe 1.72 times 10 to the second, that is scientific notation. And we, we write it like this because um, um, it's because of significant figures and it's, it's easier to represent than writing um, out a bunch of zeros. 
for very small numbers or for very large numbers. Um, it's more professional that way, and it's easier to um, to recall or you know to report, so to speak. Okay. Okay, we're gonna go. Uh, we're gonna go straight into um, some active exercises about how to do this. All right. So, so here's the active exercise. So these active exercises are designed uh, are designed for you guys to kind of work on them, like for a few minutes, and then we come back as a class to kind of work uh, to answer. So, um, clearly that is not ideal here. So what I will do is, my suggestion is you, um, you, um, I give you the act, of, I write out the exercise for you and you pause the video for like five, for maybe five, for maybe a few minutes, few to five minutes, or maybe, you know, a few minutes to work on the exercise and then you resume. And that's when I go over the problem and you can see how you did on the exercise. I think that's the best way to kind of tackle this part of the class um, remotely. So hopefully you guys agree. Um, I thought about giving five minutes of silence, but that, that's kind of, that, that'll look kind of awkward. So I, I don't want to do that. And I don't want to waste any, um, any time um, because there's a lot of stuff to get through. But let's go over the active exercise. So active, exercise okay let's convert man my writing is not good today sorry convert 3672 199 to scientific notation Okay, guys, so please try to do this on your own first, but what you have, um, what you want to do first is write out the number. Do not put any, um, do not put any commas. And now you're going to find the first non-zero digit. And after that digit, you're going to put a decimal point. So in our case, it's after the first number, three. So we're going to put decimal here. And then um, write out your exponent right here. So let's let's look at our um, our number. It's three million six hundred seventy-two thousand one hundred ninety-nine. So we have to count how many decimal points um, it will take it will take to reach the end of that number. So looking at our three here, we see we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So after it moves after the nine, we get our original number here. Um, so that means we have, I already forgot, one, two, three, four, five, six. So our number is going to be 3.672199 times 10 to the six. So since we move to the right, our, our sign for the exponent is going to be positive. And um, um, that is that is how we would do this example. All right, let's try another one. Convert convert zero point zero zero four six one to scientific notation. Okay, so we do the same thing. We write out our not. We write out our. So in this case, do not ignore the zeros. They are not important. We're just going to write out our 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 main number, which is four six one. Right. Remember, put the decimal after the first non-zero digit right there, and then we put our our exponent. And now we're going to count. Um. We're going to count how many decimal places um, we moved to the left. So. Go from your original number, go put a magic decimal point there, and we have one, two, three. So we reached the decimal point 
if we move it back three places. So, so in the case here, one, two, three. So here's the decimal point. And you put a zero here and put, and for every place you move back, put a zero. For every place you move back that does not have a number, place a zero as a placeholder. And then, and that will give us our new number. So, so let's, let's erase this for now. Um, so how do we represent that? Well, that equals 4.61 times 10 to the negative three because we moved back three decimal places. So we put the three there, and if it's to the left, it's going to be a negative sign. All right, guys, I hope that was okay. So um, that's, the, that's the basics of scientific notation. Um, scientific notation will be, impor um, will be important when you're recording like measurements. So always, um, I always encourage you to use scientific notation. Um, if there's like more than one zero that you have to write out, I would, I would use scientific notation for that. Okay. So we went over how to do that. All right. So, so let's go um, do another exercise. So that was the first exam uh, exercise. So now here's another one. Okay, convert 3.49 times 10 to the negative 11th to decimal form. So this could get really tedious because you have to write out all these zeros. So um, what you want to do is write out the number. Uh, you don't have to write out that. So you notice it's 10, negative 11. So now you need to move the decimal place 11 spaces to the left. So let's do this. Hope I don't mess up. Sorry, I messed up. This is a different pen. There we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. So here we're going to put our dot zero. And then we're going to put these placeholders in zeros. So a neat trick to this is um, when you had to move back a bunch of places where zeros, you look at the number of the exponent and you look at your um, so number of zeros. You know you have to put is whatever the exponent is minus one because there's always one one spot that's going to be occupied by this decimal here so you can always figure out how many zeros to put if you just subtract the exponent number by one so in this case it's going to be 10 zeros so then that equals to 0 0.1234567891039 and we just confirm one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight, nine, ten. So that is correct. So this can be tedious, but um, yeah, you, you know, I I won't make you like write like convert three point four nine times ten to negative twenty eight to decimal form. Don't worry. That is, that example is one cruel and um. You, you don't need to use that kind of example to demonstrate how to how to write it out in decimal form so so it'll always be realistic you know numbers that you can write out um relatively quickly in terms of a quiz or exam but do expect these type of problems up here on the first quiz all right oh there'll be a section for it okay next let's do another example we have um convert Convert 5.16 times 10 to the fourth to decimal form.
Okay, so we write let's write out our, our number and we'll take our uh our dot right here, move four places to the right. One, two, three, four. So in this case we have two zeros. So our new number is fifty one thousand six hundred. So we move four four places to the right and we get our large number. So see how easy is to represent this large number by just using scientific notation. So that's that's why we, we use it to represent large quantities. And um, even more so, you may remember what Avogadro's number is. Well, it's 10 to the 23rd. So that's why scientific notation is very handy. Because every time we do a calculation, we don't have to write out all the all the all the zeros for the for that number. All right, guys, let me just check the time. So uh, less than 20 minutes left. Okay. So I encourage you to try these examples and then double check your work by checking out how I solved them. Um, that'll be, that'll be good. That'll also, that'll be a good way to test um, um, your understanding of it. And, and that way you can always go back to what I said earlier and refer to like how to solve it. And uh, that will help you in the long run too. Okay, so let's talk about how to do this in a calculator. So um, when you're doing these type of like homework problems, you may run into using scientific notation in your calculators. Um, I, I recognize that some people may not know how to do that. So let's go over that really quick. So what you want to do, you enter, so let's, you would, one, first you would enter the coefficient number. For example, say you, you want to represent 5.16, right? You would type 5.16 and press and press e e or exp on your calculator okay then you would it will prompt you for uh the, the number for the exponent. So type the exponent and press and press the equals key. Um, and then you would, then you would use that um, then you will use that in your calculation. Then you can do add it, multiply, divide it. Um, I don't know if you ever have a situation where you need to turn a number in decimal form to scientific notation. Um, I don't think you have to do that. Mainly because you can just type out the number. But um, if you need, um, if you need to for like. I don't know, you just want to be quicker doing a calculation. There should be a notation key called the scientific notation key and it, uh, the abbreviation should be SCI, but I doubt you'll have to use that. The, the, this one I talked about, that's pretty much the important one that you'll need to know. Um, so hopefully that guys uh, will help you. That will help you, okay. All right, now we're gonna talk about quantity. So we talked about scientific notation, but, but why? Well. Now we're going to talk about how we represent quantities and how we um, can manip uh, sorry, not manipulate, um, convert them to different units. Okay. Well, let me get water. My throat is dry. So quantity. So in chemistry, We must express quantities as a 
as a product of a numerical value and a unit. So quantities don't make sense if you just say a number. It doesn't make sense if you just say a unit. So they, we must have some sense of what, you know, um, like how much does this weigh, right? The unit and the value gives very important information. So quantity is value times unit. So for let's try this example. Example express 50 minutes in seconds. So um, what you would do, remember we, we do this 50 times minutes. So, um, so now we're going to talk about something called dimensional analysis. I don't know if you guys know what that means, but um, when I first learned dimensional analysis many, many years ago, I, I thought it was too hard to understand. So I, I, I rarely used it because I, I tend to memorize the conversion, but that, that tends to trip some people up sometimes. So I, I just want you to get the hang of it because once you learn it, it's, um, it's a breeze. So um, what you want to, dimensional analysis is all about setting up these, these like fractions or conversion factors that help you get to the unit you want. So if we want minutes, so we, we're given minutes and we want seconds. So we think about this as a product, right? So if I want to cancel out my minutes, that means my minutes, it looks like my minutes is on, is on, the, is on the top, right? It's being multiplied. So in order to cancel minutes and turn it into um, a factor of one, we need to put minutes as our denominator, right? So that way this will, these will cancel. And now how many minutes are in a second? Sorry, not the other way around. How many seconds are in a minute? 60. So we do 60 times seconds. And that will give us our conversion, sig 50 times 60 times seconds, which equates to 3,000 seconds, right? So, so that is one example how we convert quantities into different units. So now let's, let's try this exercise. Okay. So uh, based on what I just said, let's go over this. So say you have the oldest horse racing track in the US is the eight furlong was uh was sentation fairgrounds racetrack that's not full in california what is the length of the track in rods. So what you need to know is 0 0.025 furlong is equal to one rod. Okay, let me erase that. That looks okay. So how do we set this up? Well, so we know that the length of the track is eight 
furlong, right? So write eight furlongs. And we our conversion factor is 0 0.025 furlong is equal to one rod. So we want to put the rod on top of the fraction because that is what we want. So we want so what we want is want rod given is furlong. So furlong, the, uh, the conversion factor, what we're given is on the bottom and what we want is on the top. Two five furlong. And what we end up with is 320 rods. So these are units of length. If they sound kind of strange, that's okay. They're not common, I would say, but um, they are used still. So, um, so when we say that like 0 0.25 for long is equal to one run, that's an equivalency statement and they're used as a conversion factor between two different units. That's all you need to know about um, conversion factors and when to use them is when we're converting units to different uh, unit to a different uh, another unit of the same quantity, right? You can't use one conversion factor to convert to a unit that is not in the same quantity category. So for example, you can't use a conversion factor for volume for length. So um, that's not, um, that's not, that's not how it works. Okay. So let's practice now writing equivalency um, statements like the following. So here's another active exercise. Um, so, so, okay. So one day is 24 hours. So what I want you to do is practice writing an equivalency statement and writing a, um, a conversion factor using a fraction that represents how we can use on the statement. So what you should have got is one day equals 24 hours. And we could we could represent this by either dividing like this. So this will cancel and we have this fa this factor right here. 24 hours is one day or we could say one day equals 24 hours and have the following divide both sides by 24 hours. So now we have these two fractions, right? 24 hours over one day or one day equal 24 hours. Okay, so, um, and then the next one is my car averages 70 miles miles per gallon. So how will we um, represent that? So 17 miles equals one gallon. And then we do the same uh, same procedure as we did for the other one and we should come up with these two fractions. 17 miles for one gallon and one gallon over 17 miles. Okay, guys. So the only way to get comfortable um, using these conversion factors is to do practice problems. And what I suggest is you find the unit you want and then I, um, find the unit you have and the unit you have 
you always use the fraction that has that unit in the what you have in the denominator and what you want on the, the numerator. So you all you always you always be correct if you use that kind of setup. Uh, one thing to also think about is look at the value. Does it make sense? Like um, so, if I'm converting, let's go back to the gallon the gallon one. So if I'm converting from gallons to miles, then my miles should be, be should be the bigger number because if you see the conversion factor, one gallon equals 70 miles. Um, likewise, if I start with miles and I'm going to a gallon, then my number should be smaller than what I started out with. So always double check your answer. That'll always give you a second check about whether your answer makes sense. Okay, guys, let's check the time. All right, guys, we'll do this last exercise and we'll call it a day. Okay, so I want you to calculate the number of weeks in 672 hours. Okay, guys. So, what you want to do first, so we're given what are we given? 672 hours. Notice that it's a unit of time, time units. What we're what we're what what's wanted is time units weeks. So let's let's now list the equivalency factors that we'll need. Twenty four hours equals one day, and then so since we're given in hours, right? We want to convert to days, so our fraction will be one day over 24 hours. So that's the fraction we want to use. Now we need to convert from days to weeks. So we're going to use seven days, right? Because there's seven days in a week. Um, and that will give us equals one week. And since we want to go from days to the week, we, uh, we're going to use this fraction. One week equals seven days. So now we just, um, so notice that we went from the larger value to the smaller value. So our final answer should be a, 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 a smaller value than what we started with. So let's just put all these things together. 672 hours is what we're given. Then we combine, combine these fractions. One day over 24 hours times one week over seven days. So we notice that our hours will cancel, days will cancel, and we're left with is week. And then what we should get is four weeks. All right, and that, that makes sense, right? Because what we start out with is um, a larger value for each, uh, for each of these fractions. And so what we should end up is, is something way smaller at the end for weeks. Okay, guys. Um, so we are going to stop there. Um, um, uh, if you have any questions, if you still don't have access to the homework, let me know. But... 
Um, that is it. We'll pick off on chapter three um, next week. I know we're kind of behind in the schedule, um, so we'll try to we'll try to pick it up. But um, for right now, um, this homework schedule will stand. So um, um, uh, please try to get to it uh, as soon uh, as soon as you can. But if there's nothing else. Have a have a great weekend. Um, try to have fun um, and stay safe. Um, and I'll see you guys next week. All right, guys. See ya.